Okay, today we're going to talk about um, chapter 7. We're going to focus mostly on the Silk Road. And as we start time period 3, our third wave civilizations, um, I want you to think about some major continuities and changes from these next several chapters. Um, think about big picture things that um, remain constant from time period 2 to time period 3 and some of the major changes that are occurring as some empires form, some empires fall apart, and how they become more connected. Um, one of the common themes from this third wave civilizations is how the world's different regions, cultures, and people are going to interact with one another much more extensively. Um, prior to this, we did have some limited interaction between states and empires, but as we move forward through this new time period, it's going to be much more extensive. It's much more common, and it crosses a much longer distance. And really, this is going to focus on um, a change in human societies and how that is a product of contact with strangers. So anytime civilizations are going to come in contact with other ones, it's going to result in some changes. Some of these changes are good, and some of them are um, not so good. You have an exchange of ideas. This is going to be technology, religions, um, philosophies that are going to move from one place to the next. Um, interactions of armies. So we're going to have some conflict here. We have um, disease, goods that are going to travel from one place to another, as well as diseases, unfortunately. And one of those patterns of interaction that develops here is long-distance trade. Um, so throughout the world, we have different ecological zones, which means that we have an uneven distribution of goods and resources. Not everyone in the world can produce the same resources. Um, and because of this, we have some states that create an early monopolization of certain goods. If you have a monopoly on something, it means that you control all of it. So for example, for several centuries, um, China has a monopolization on silk. They are the only culture that knows how to produce silk, and they definitely use that to their advantage. As well, in Southeast Asia, they have a monopoly on spices. So, for example, um, the pepper that you probably have at home, for hundreds of years, it's only produced off this one little island on the southwest coast of India. So these, goods, these um, empires, these states, end up having a monopoly on it. And what happens is you see that one state wants what another one has. Well, do you want what that state has? And we have trade that um, results from this. So long distance trade develops in this third wave civilization, um, which is characterized as expanding interactions between 500 and 1500 CE, common era. Um, this trade's really kind of made possible by nomads from inner Afro-Eurasia um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, they travel by horses, so they can travel longer distances, they can carry more with them, and because they've been in contact with different um, other settled societies, they have an immunity to diseases. So the combination of immunity and horses make them this ideal agent for linking these distant communities. And this trade is going to shape culture and society around the world. Um, most of the trade, though, here is going to be indirect. Um, the word Silk Road is kind of a misnomer because it wasn't just one Silk Road. Um, it was several, several trade routes connecting China to regions to the west. Um, it's important to know that these are indirect links. They are not direct links. It is not one merchant traveling from Beijing all the way into Rome. These goods often are traveling farther than the merchants are. Um, so they're going to reach their destinations indirectly. They're going to pass through several different hands rather than one person, like I said, making the several thousand mile journey along the entire Silk Road. And the trade is going to have several um, impacts economically, politically, socially. 
Um, and one of the economic things is that it's going to alter the consumption. It's going to change what, what types of goods people are using. Um, and an important example that you'll need to know here is that um, West Africans can now use salt to flavor and preserve their food. Um, salt's kind of one of those overlooked things, but it's essential to our diet. And it's one of the most valuable commodities up until about 100 years ago when they really realized how common it was. Um, so West Africa is able to use salt. Um, this trade's also going to change the day-to-day -day lives of individuals. Now that trade is growing, we have specialization, which means that people can focus on one particular skill or occupation rather than trying to produce everything, which leads to a less self-sufficient society and more dependency on others. So no longer is one area producing everything that they think they need. Instead, they're going to focus on a few things and instead get the rest from someone else. This trade also has an important um, social significance. Your traders become their own social group. If you remember when we talked about the Han China and their um, social hierarchy, Remember that the um, merchants were not necessarily seen as good guys. They saw them suspiciously. They didn't trust them. They kind of thought, why are you making money without actually making the goods? But through these third wave civilizations, trade really becomes a means of social mobility. During this time, money equals land equals power and status. So what happens is some traders would use their money obviously, and buy a whole bunch of land, and then kind of work their way up the social ladder. Um, trade was also used by elite groups to separate themselves from commoners. Um, a big example here is with silk. So only the wealthy could afford these luxury goods. Um, there were certain societies, I think it was Rome, that pretty much put laws on who could wear silk and who couldn't. Um, and it definitely became a social status indicator. This long distance trade also has political significance. Um, controlling and taxing the trade motivates the creation of states and kingdoms. If you remember, for example, when we talked about the Axum Empire from time period two, they definitely became wealthy simply by controlling and taxing the trade. Um, wealth from their trade is also going to support these states and kingdoms and facilitate their growth. So they're going to profit from the trade and use it to grow their empires, grow their power. But it wasn't just goods that were traded. We also had religious ideas that traveled. Um, technological innovations such as saddles. Diseases are going to go back and forth. And they're also trading plants and animals. Um, so it's more than just silk and ivory that's moving back and forth. And the Silk Road is the first trade network that we're going to focus on. It connects Han China over here in Luoyang, and it goes all the way to Antioch, the um, eastern edge of the Roman Empire. You can see... It's a very extensive network. It goes through the Taklobankan Desert, the Kushan Empire, through Persia, and all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and just as a side note, the Silk Road, the trade connections between the Han, Han and the Roman Empires is a common question um, on the AP exam. So as we talk about this, you're going to need to know example, and we'll go through examples of cultural diffusion, cultural traditions that are changing, um, consequences of this trade network, and um, the exchange of religious ideas. So these, um, the Silk Road, the expansion of it, you know, it's linking. China through Central Asia all the way over to the Mediterranean really brings a commercial integration of this Afro-Eurasian world. Um, 
in the expansion of this business of the trade between the Mediterranean and South Asia over into the Han Dynasty reinforces this rise in commercial activity. So, the growth of the Silk Road um, has to do with the different zones of Eurasia. Um, it's often divided into inner and outer zones that have different ecologies. So outer Eurasia is typically warm and well watered. This is going to include China, India, the Middle East, and the Mediterranean. So outer Eurasia is going to be the southern part. What's in purple here is most of inner Eurasia. And you can see you have the Gobi Desert, the Taklamakan Desert, Mongolia up here. So inner Eurasia is a much harsher, drier climate. It's going to include what is now Eastern Russia as well as Central Asia. And as a result of this, your steppe products from inner Eur um, Eurasia, things like hides, furs, livestock, wool, amber, and horses are traded for agricultural products and manufactured goods. Um, these different zones needing basically kind of what other people have and you don't is the birth of the Silk Trades Network. Silk Roads Trade Network, sorry. And the empire grows with the formation of these classical civilizations and empires. Um, they add new players to it, like the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, Roman Empire, Han Dynasty, Gupta. All of these help the Silk Road to grow. The Silk Road really does best. It's most prosperous. So you have the most trade going back and forth when you have large and or powerful states empires, nations, that can provide security for merchants and travelers along the road. Um, kind of makes sense. If you make sure that your merchants, your travelers, and your goods are getting from one place to another safely, you're going to have a healthier trade network. And it really revives later in the 7th and 8th century, so in our time period 3, as the um, Byzantine Empire, the Abbasid and Tang the Abbasid dynasty, which is their Muslim empire, and the Tang dynasty in China um, really create an almost continuous belt of strong central states across Eurasia, so that helps the Silk Road um, become more prosperous. And the goods that are traded here are mostly luxury goods rather than staple goods. Um, these are things that are destined for an elite and a wealthy market. And we have luxury goods traded rather than your staple goods because these were seen as the only goods worth transporting with such a high transportation cost. So these would be things like silk, um, mirrors, paper um, coming out of China, you've got furs, walrus tucks, livestock horses coming out of Central Asia and Siberia, cotton from India which is very valuable, precious stones and spices from India and from the Mediterranean basis you have gold everybody likes gold, glassware, um, jewelry, perfume and such coming from Mediterranean. So the important goods coming out of the Silk Road it gets its name from one of the most important products, silk. It's a major product in high demand. Um, it is a social symbol. It is used as currency in certain areas. Um, let me see if I can move this down a little bit so we can... There you go. Now you can see the whole thing. Um, China has a monopoly on silk until the, five, until the 500s. They are the only people, culture, that knows how to produce silk. Um, but after the 500s, others gained knowledge of silk production. Um, there was a legend that it was a Chinese princess that smuggled silkworms in her turban out of China when she married a Central Asian ruler. Uh, but here is an example of a diffusion as others gain knowledge of silk production. But when they gain this knowledge, they also increase the supply of silk along the Silk Roads. And at this time, silk really does kind of make the world go round. 
It's used as a currency in Central Asia. Um, it was a tool in diplomacy with nomadic kingdoms. Um, so China would use this to pay off neighboring nomads in borderlands. Um, basically, they're using silk to buy horses in peaceful borders. Um, it's a very strong, smooth fabric. It looks and honestly feels rich. Um, but it was also used for more than clothing. They used it for bowstrings, um, strings for lutes, which is a musical instrument. It was used for fishing lines. And if they um, spun it tight enough, it was used for a light armor or as um, bags for traveling, transporting liquids, which could be very important along the Silk Roads. And before they invented paper, they used silk to record histories on. Um, Silk becomes a symbol of high status in both China and the Byzantine Empire. Um, it is something that only the wealthy basically can afford. It is the ultimate prestige commodity of, region, of the region's ruling classes. So it's a symbol of high power, high status. Um, silk's also used in expanding religions of Buddhism and Christianity. Um, for example, the Tang Dynasty in China would give Buddhist monks um, purple silk robes as a sign of high status. Christians would use silk um, for wall hangings, altar covers in their Christian churches, and vestments that were basically a sign of devotion and piety. So silk becomes very important, very central to our missionary religions of Buddhism and Christianity. But when we think about um, silk trade, the volume of trade is relatively small, comparatively speaking. That means, like, compared to modern day trade exchange of these goods, it's pretty modest, it's pretty small. Um, we do have this focus on luxury goods, which is going to limit the direct impact on people. Not everybody can afford these goods that are traveling along the Silk Road. But it does have very large social and economic impact. Um, for example, peasants in China and the Yangtze River would stop cultivating their food crops and instead focus on producing silk, paper, porcelain, or iron tools. <sighs> Sorry if you guys just heard my dog cough really loud there. She's old. Um, maybe one day I'll sneak her into one of these because she's adorable. But anyways, um, one of the other social impacts of this is that merchants are now making enormous profits. Even though they are a less respected social class, um, they are able to move forward. Okay, sorry, I had to pause it for a second while she got it out of her system. Okay, so... One major result of trade along the Silk Roads is the spread of Buddhism. Um, Buddhism comes out of India into Central and East Asia. Okay, so these monks are coming out of India, um, and they're really inspired by the spread of Hellenism from, through Alexander the Great and his spread of Greek culture. And they travel out of India, they go eastward into Central and East Asia. Um, and Buddhism is spread through these Indian traders and these Buddhist monks. When the um, Buddhist monks get to China and Central Asia through the Silk Road. Okay, sorry. Um, so, Buddhist monks and Indian traders, when they reach the eastern edge of the Han Empire, they're able to translate the Buddhist texts into Chinese and other languages. Um, and it spreads to these oasis cities in Central Asia, and as people convert, they do so voluntarily, which means that they're not being coerced by their government to convert. Um, they do so on their own accord. And Buddhism is going to give these small cities a link to the larger, wealthy, and prestigious civilization of India. Um, a lot of these cities become centers of learning and commerce as monasteries are established. Um, and as Buddhism takes hold, 
it kind of changes. The original faith, if you remember, is all about shunning the material world, following the Eightfold Path to reach enlightenment. Um, and now Buddhism is much more materialistic. You have very wealthy monks, elaborate and expensive monasteries, and so on. Um, the Buddhism, Buddhist transformation in China, um, one thing to note is that it didn't happen overnight. It took several centuries and new waves of migrations for Buddhism to take root in China. And um, it actually never really becomes established in the Iranian plateau, so in Persia, um, partly because of Zoroastrianism. Um, if you remember, it's the state religion of Persia. It's so firmly established there that it doesn't really allow Buddhism to take hold. And also in a lot of Central Asia and around the Iranian plateau, we have no written language. So it makes it harder for this religion to um, establish itself in that area. But the type of Buddhism that spreads is the Mahayana. If you remember, the Mahayana is the type of Buddhism that sees Buddha as a deity, so they do see Buddha as a god. Um, you have several bodhisattvas here, so several other gods to worship. And this one kind of takes hold mostly because you have that um, emphasis on compassion and earning merit, and this type of Buddhism becomes the most popular as it spreads into China. And we'll talk about why here in a couple minutes. Actually, it leads perfectly into why the compassionate Buddha takes hold, because long-distance trade doesn't just spread um, goods and ideas, it also spreads diseases. It, we have exposure to unfamiliar diseases. As human communities come in contact with one another and expose people to unfamiliar diseases, um, it has a large impact because most people have very little immunity or effective methods of coping with these diseases. Um, modern day example would be like Ebola in West Africa. Um, they have a little immunity to it, they have not seen that strain of Ebola before, and they have very poor coping mechanisms for it. So the first example we see of diseases spreading through the Silk Road happens in Athens. Um, there is a widespread epidemic which kills 25% of the army, which kind of leads to part of Athens' decline. Um, we also see measles and smallpox devastate the Roman and the Han empires. And um, as a result of this... Um, First of all, these diseases, the measles and smallpox, uh, contribute to the collapse of these empires, um, but they also strengthen the appeal of Christianity and Buddhism, possibly because both of those religions, respectively, um, have an emphasis on compassion in the face of immense suffering. So you have a rise of Christianity in Rome and a rise of Buddhism in, in China as a result of these diseases. Um, the Mediterranean world comes into contact the bubonic plague from India. Um, this is another example of disease. Um, sorry, I just needed to check real quick. So, the Black Death, or the bubonic plague, comes in from black rats, nasty, filthy rats, that carry the disease through um, seaborne trade with India. And it is catastrophic. Catastrophic, sorry. Um, for instance, Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire loses thousands per day for about 40 days. Um, and it really prevents the prevents Byzantium from reintegrating with Italy and trying to form its version of a renewed Roman Empire. Um, this disease just decimates the population. And one of our biggest examples from the Mongols, Black Death, spread mostly because the Mongols unite most of Eurasia in the 13th and 14th centuries. Um, the Black Death could have been a few different things. It could have been bubonic plague, could have been anthrax, or a collection of epidemic diseases. 
Um, but what is true about it is that its effects are decimating these populations. Um, so with this increased interaction, disease is able to spread much more quickly. Um, between 1346 and 1350, it kills about a third of the European population. Um, on the bad side, obviously you've got a third of the Europe that has died. Um, it hurts your landowners as they have fewer workers, increased demands. Um, but one positive effect that we'll get to here in a few weeks is that it allows tenant farmers and urban workers to demand higher wages. You've got an issue of supply and demand here. You have a smaller supply of workers, so they're able to demand, so they're in higher demand, and they can ask for higher wages. Um, you also have a similar death toll in China and parts of the Islamic world from the Black Plague. Um, it undermines the Mongols' rule. You know, they came into town and a third of the population has died, so people aren't exactly happy about the Mongols. And it also um, shifts the balance between pastoral and agricultural people to advantage, to the advantage of the settled farmers. So, sorry, I didn't mean to click out of it. And go back to it. Sorry, you still needed it, and I did it again. So, just to review, um, some of the important things that you need to note and common topics on this have to do with trade connections between the Roman and the Han empires, um, how this increased interaction incre um, increases diffusion and in cultural traditions, specifically uh, religions and philosophies. We have technologies that are spread. Um, and you'll need to know examples and consequences of diseases spreading through these trade routes. Um, put a little star by the Black Death because you absolutely need to know that one. It is a very um, significant historical event. So make sure that you bring your notes with you and any questions you have over the Silk Road to you with, um, with you to school on Monday. And we will talk more about trade routes then.